Hello and welcome to today's video. So this time we're going to have a look through my collection of vintage Puffin storybooks and these are the ones in my collection from Puffin Storybook 101 up to Puffin Storybook 200. Now I've by no means got them all but I've got most of them so uh, that's what we're going to be having a look at cleaning and repairing today. So sit back relax and let's get to it. Okay, so starting off with a, a real classic here, Robin Hood, uh, Roger Lanceland Green. He did quite a few of the early Puffin storybooks. And this is a uh, Puffin Storybook 101, PS 101. And quite a nice copy of this one by the looks of it. And when's this dating from 1956? Yeah, nice copy of that. Now, a lot of these have got um, paper covers, so we're not going to be able to give them a polish at the end but we are certainly going to be able to clean all the edges and um we'll do the insides first to make sure that they're all looking as good as possible uh, 102 here four mysteries solved by norman and henry bones <laughs> and it's uh really good to look through some of these because this second hundred is a run that i've been really trying to work on over the last couple of years since i've I've got the first hundred complete now and uh, they're not as easy to find as you might think um, possibly because they were aimed at children so the copies haven't really survived in really nice condition um, but on the whole most of my puffins aren't too bad this is 103 here red cap runs away but they are certainly in need of a, a good brush and this one has got the remnants of some pencil writing inside here. Quite a bit of pencil in this one. The main thing is with these ones is you have to hope that there's no child's name inside, although, you know, sometimes it doesn't really matter, does it? I don't mind a previous owner's name, in all honesty. Almost there on this one. There Red cat runs away, eh? story savage gold and fuller and there we are look. this book looks belongs to richard kemp the owner's label pasted inside but apart from that it doesn't look like richard actually read it <laughs> Secret of Smugglers Wood. And Puffin were really, uh, had in fact, all, by this point already found their identity. And I think it's a really, really good sort of period for Puffin this, right the way through to, well, for the next 10, 10 years or so. Just fantastic. I sort of regret a little bit that when my children are grown up, um, they weren't into a few more of these books that I loved as a kid. Even like the real classics, like the Roll Dowls and that. Um, right, I'm going to stick a little bit of glue in there. I do remember reading the, the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory books, and The Great Glass Elevator, and Danny, Champion of the World, which is another one I really, really enjoyed. And that was a Puffin, of course, Charlotte's Web. The Hobbit. I read when I was young, but I didn't read the Puffin edition, which we will see a little bit later today. Um, I read the one from the late 70s, it was Unwin, I think it was, was the publisher. I remember very much enjoying that.
but over the years, Puffin have published all the great children's classics, haven't they? Pretty much. There we are. That's gluing in that bit of spine there. Stop that getting any worse. As I said, apart from doing what we're doing, going through them carefully, taking out any interior prices, stickers and things like that, and repairing any spine damage, the last sort of step of the process with these is just to give them a brush off. So um, I won't be able to give any of these a polish because they've not got shiny covers, they're matte covers. And the, uh, the polish would just soak in and ruin them. So we don't want to be doing that. That's nice illustrations, isn't it? Moon ahead. Magic in my pocket. Yeah, see, that's the sort of thing that is quite common in uh, little Puffin storybooks. I'm not going to worry too much about it because apart from that, it's not too bad a copy. I might be tempted to put it on a upgrade list, but in all honesty, it's borderline and the borderline says no, not really. The Haunted Reef, Frank Crisp. 109. A lot of these are, of course, trying to find the next sort of famous five or secret seven. They were big hits back then. Got a few couple of turned over corners here. Someone's been reading it. I don't mind that, that's what I used to do in actual fact. To turn the corner over when I was younger, anyway. Wouldn't dare do that now, of course. It's a bookmark or nothing. There we go. Nice. Oh, this is a lovely, lovely one, the borrowers. Shame it's got the tear there, but it's had some tape around it like that. It's a beautiful cover. Absolute classic. Very nice. 1958. Ah, look, the cover's coming off there, so. Yeah, I think it's going to come away. <laughs> I've had this one a long time. I'm not altogether surprised. There we are, that glue, let's just come away. So we'll get this little 3D. Is that ink? Oh, unfortunately it's ink. It's not pencil. There was pencil there. So this is definitely one that, you know, is gonna be on the old improver list. I'm gonna to look to upgrade this one because it's such a key book. But the glue, has had it so just give us the chance to look at that lovely cover in all its glory very very nice but yeah i wouldn't mind a better copy of this one so what i'm going to do in the meantime i'm obviously going to repair this now so we'll pop a line of prit stick down the spine here nothing too dramatic pretty straightforward Do the same on here. So both edges are good as we can get them. Yeah, not great that. Certainly wouldn't mind a better copy in all honesty, but it is, you know, I'm imagining this is um, quite an expensive puffin storybook to have generally it's got to be at least a tenner i would think for a really nice one just because it's such a gorgeous book but i don't know I mean, it's not one i've looked up because obviously i've had it for years and really that's one that i have had for a long time let's do the second wedge of this pile so this is the puffin puzzle book these are always pretty scarce you know the puffin puzzle books a bit like the uh the adult counterparts. 
a few puzzles have been attempted there, but I'm not, I generally don't bother like rubbing out things like that. It is a little bit loose there, so I'm going to run a little bit of glue down there just to stop this getting any worse. Fold it over the corner there. So it's not perfect, but it's not end of the world bad at all. It's just uh, had a little bit of use, should we say, but not much. So it's still a nice, uh, nice collectible copy. That's certainly good enough. Good enough for me. That's for certain. And I would think for most collectors, in all honesty. There are people who just collect the puffins, of course. And that's that's not me. I've always sort of loved the books for what they are. Um, but I've connected, collected them because of the, the penguin connection. Now there are a whole range of puffin picture books. And I've got maybe about, they did 100, 119 and I've got maybe 40 to 50 um, so I haven't got many of those it's not something I've ever really pushed to to try and track them down um, but now that some of the other series are coming to a close I might be tempted to try and get a few more and on the whole apart from a few exceptions the puffin picture books they're all fairly plentiful and there's not many that are really really ridiculous money um, so you know, maybe I'll give those a try. So, 113, The Perilous Descent into a Strange Lost World. Hmm. That's okay. 114, The Singing Forest. Oh. Mortimer Batten. This one's a little bit the worse for wear, but not enough to warrant looking for a replacement. Not really. Let's pull this little wedge over here. Bush Holiday. Treasure Seekers, another gorgeous, gorgeous jacket. Very, very nice indeed. It's virtually unread by the look of it. Cecile Leslie says the illustrations are by. Not sure if that's also the cover. I can't see like an artist only signature or anything so we'll assume that that was the cover artist as well going into the past this is a one of their non-fiction ones on archaeology by the looks of it they did a few of these not a massive fan of them but i understand why it came out as a puffin another one in that series going to the opera of course lots of youngsters went to the opera didn't they let's be honest I'm not surprised that this is in remarkably great condition because I doubt anyone's ever read it. <laughs> Tiny remnants of a pencil price in the corner. There we go. Tales of the Greek Heroes, another one by Roger Lanslin Green. He really made this market his own, didn't he? And particularly in Puffin. He had a few, a few published by them. In the 90s, uh, Roger Lanslin Green had a, had a son called Richard Lanslin Green. And Richard Lanslin Green was a very big Sherlock Holmes collector. Very, very big collector. And he had studied it and uh, wrote some books on it. Very learned fellow on uh, Sherlock Holmes. And... Uh, when I had my store, we bought the contents of a Sherlock Holmes museum on Dartmoor because the owner had to sell up for health reasons. We bought, I say we bought the contents, we bought a lot of the contents, lots of books, another one by him, lots of books um, we ended up buying and some merchandise and what have you. And Richard Lanston Green bought quite a bit of us. 
and uh, sent it off. And I said to him at the time via email, oh, are you the, uh, are you the any relation to Roger Lancelin Green? I used to read a lot of his books when I was a kid. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm his son. And that was that. That's what I sort of thought about it. I kid you not, the next year, um, I'm on my way. I've been to America on holiday and I was on my way back traveling through the airport and I was looking at the magazines for something to read. Um, and um, there was an article. It was the strange case of Richard Lanson Green. I thought, what the hell's this? You know, so I picked it up and I basically I, I was it was like Time magazine or something like that. And basically Richard Lanson Green, for whatever reason, had taken his own life. And what made it even more mysterious was that he'd created a Sherlock Holmes style puzzle for the police to solve his suicide. Basically, if you if you can actually believe that, you know, um, so that's what happened. Um, and I forget the exact area where it was I think maybe Norwich or somewhere like that or Norfolk. But um, his collection, which was really, really special of Conan Doyle memorabilia, I believe Stephen Fry purchased it and then donated the whole lot to a uh, to the local museum so it could all stay together because um, Stephen Fry is a bit of a Conan Doyle buff as well in Sherlock Holmes. But I thought, wow, we this was only like a year after we, you know, been sort of dealing with each other. So I was really surprised at that. Um, you can look it up online, uh, Richard Lanson Green death or something like that or suicide and you'll find the full sort of story but it was like wow we very very surprising there we are so that's the first like little wedge now i think you need to give these a bit of a brush and we're doing them in like little hands here actually i'm going to do them in slightly smaller three and smaller hands like that need to be able to give them a good a good grip as it were i don't think well these have never ever been cleaned but they have come from various sources so some of these shouldn't be too bad others i think are going to be pretty awful you know so we'll just deal with it as we go along i think Just depends how long they've been in my collection really i mean back when i started buying old penguins lots of them i used to pick up at boot sales and jumble sales and in charity shops and not actual bookshops at all so they would generally not be in great shape and i would i wouldn't even take their names out often i just stick it on the shelf you know that's made quite a difference to like that one there Three little wedges. Quite a bit of dust coming off these. But that's good. That's a good thing because it means they're getting really nice and clean.
Yeah, I'd put a bit come off that one there. You can almost sort of see where the brush has really done its work. Lovely, so that is the first just under of three stacks of these puffins. So let's get on with stack number two. This is quite one for the youngsters, Adventures of the Little Wooden Horse. So this is almost like a junior puffin, although they do release some of those later on. We'll see them there, they're, like, they're called baby puffins. So stories for the very young. Uh, we haven't also seen any in B format yet, but that is also something that's coming up. This is a, a nice one. Um, I actually thought my copy of this was a little bit better than, than it actually is. Um, it's one I absolutely loved as a kid, this, Emil and the Detectives. I remember reading it very, very, very well back in the day. Um, now we can give this a little bit of a tidy because the top of the spine is uh, coming away there so we'll glue that back in for starters but once again I suppose if I ended up getting this series complete um, this is one that I probably would put on my upgrade list because it's also a favorite of mine obviously I would have read a, a 70s copy of this one I can't really remember the story, but I remember loving the book. And it's funny how that happens, isn't it? But yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a beaten up one that, but we won't hold it against them. I shall uh, just look for a better one down the line. One, two, seven, the cave twins. <laughs> it's literally come away in my hands. Look at that. So it must have been a little thing with the glue that was used when these were being published that some of the spines just haven't, you know, the glue over the course of 65 years, which is how old these books are. These are all from 1957. So as we filmed this 65 years ago, these books, the glue that was used just as uh, started to come away in some cases. It may not be on all of them, but maybe, you know, one, the glue that one particular printer used has just not survived as well as others, you know, and that's sometimes how it can go. I'm going to make sure we sign properly. That's okay. Running repairs. Another classic here. Phoenix and the carpet. This is 1959, so we have moved on a year or two now. Story of the amulet. Another one by Ina Nesbitt now. It's got a 10 there and it's in it's in ink and there's also the remnants of a sticker down the bottom but it's not something we can do much about unfortunately yeah been through there was a little bit this one i think it'll benefit from a good brush looking at the dustiness of it just don't think there's anything we can really do with that sticker down the bottom there Avalanche. As I said, collecting children's books is fraught with danger. <laughs> you just never can tell what they're going to be like. And in a way, it's much harder to collect children's books than adult books because, well, they're designed for children. So children read them and they don't take care of them. They're just looking to have a good story, aren't they? So, uh, collecting children's books does have its own particular problems. 
for some people I guess that's part of the fun this one seems very that no <laughs> that's three now so definitely books from this period which uh, suffered a little bit in the old gluing stakes I mean, apart from that it's quite a nice little copy clear out the old bits of glue and we'll just do the same again re-glue it back in Easy. Hmm. So that's what three we've had to re glue today. Incredible, eh? I never would have guessed that. Sabotage at the Forge. A story for boys set in a Tyneside steelworks. That's pretty specific, isn't it? A few turned over corners here. I just got biffed by the look of it. those corners out story of Jesus Eleanor Graham she was the puffin editor from when it started through she's got a few more years to go then it's taken over by a lady called Kay Webb who brought some sort of more modern titles to the list this is number 136. A little bit of a price in there. Now this one is number 137, but it's in a, a later format, so it's either a reprint or, yeah, so it came out in 1967, as opposed to these, which are about 1959. It is the correct number, and it's in the correct space. Um, I've got the later editor there, K Webb. Um, it's just, for whatever reason, the number wasn't used at the time, or this book got delayed, and... Uh, but there it is, numerically, and that's how we're looking through these, it's numerically. Um, here's another borrower's book, Mary Norton. Very, very nice indeed. Same style of um, artwork. Absolutely gorgeous books, these, the Borrowers series. Very, very nice indeed. I suppose since my kids didn't read a lot of these when they were growing up, I'm going to have to rely on grandchildren <laughs> to read some of these two now. Start another pile now. The Saga of Asgard, another one by Roger Lanston Green. Didn't realize you wrote so many. That was the first one I spotted, which was 1960. Tiger in the Dark. Ah, now, 
the next couple are actually out of place. So I am just going to take this little wedge here and make sure that these next few are all in the correct order because we want to do them numerically. So we have 1, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 3, 8, 3, 9. Yeah, these are ever so slightly out of order. I think that's a bit of a liberty if you ask me. How dare they? Here we are then, number 140. That was 139. So, Fell Farm Campers. Another very nice one. Shirley Hughes was the illustrator. You might recognise her name. She actually passed away, I think, last year. But she went on to write her own uh, children's bestsellers. Now, that's also got a little bit of spine coming away at the bottom. So, just going to get a little sliver here. And not, it's not massive. Just enough to sort of... There we are. Just sort of get in there. There we are. But although I've not read Fell Farm Campers, I believe the Fell Farm books are very good. Eleanor Fargen's book of stories, verses and plays. And this one very much is illustrated by Edward Ardazoni, as you can clearly see. Beautiful. Right, there's some writing at the back there, so we'll get rid of that in a minute. Yeah, nothing at the front, it's all at the back and it's in a terrible spot. I'm assuming it's in pencil. Well, these bits are, so yes. Right, that was the easy bit. This bit, not so easy because they're in an awful spot. Thankfully, they've come off all right. There we are. Looking good. That's a really, really nice one, that. It really is great. Lovely. That is what you call a nice puffin. Second puffin quiz book. Number 142. A hundred million francs. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Oh no, there are no francs anymore, it's euros. I'll have a hundred million euros, please. Very, very nicely illustrated, that. Right the way through, great illustrations. Look at these. Nice. Snow Cloud Stallion. See, these are still Eleanor Graham, the original Puffin editor. The Orphans of Symmetra. Sixty-one. Yeah, got a few little faults that one, but nothing I can actually repair. Sadly, the silver sword. Oh, look at that! Another real classic, the Railway Children. Shame it's got a one and six, which means it's probably been through the second hand 
system possibly. Another classic puffin book. Yeah, it's been second hand. It's a shame because on on the whole, it's not a bad copy. But you know, as I said, that is what happens with children's books. They're not always perfect, you know. Four feet and two. Anthology of verse. This is number one forty-eight. And it does appear as if I've got far more of the first fifty than of the second fifty. So it looks like there are a fair few missing in the second hundred, more than I thought in actual fact. But that's okay, that's the fun of collecting. It was still a good box load to go through, which is the main thing. There we are. First of the Moomin books we've seen, Fim Family Moon Intro. That's got a tiny little bit of glue into it, having a minute. Highly collectible, these books, and uh, got a lot of fans, a lot of fans. I did have a later 70s Moomin box set, which um, I did really like. However, someone in Japan. I put it on my Instagram years ago, this was, um, and um, someone in Japan contacted me and they, they basically, they just offered me stupid money for it. So I said, yeah, fine, you can have it because it wasn't pre ISBN, which is my main period. So I let it go, but it was a nice moon box. It had four books in, but they were all sort of seventies ones, not like this, which is early sixties. In fact, this is the very first moon book. But yeah, very, very collectible. Never read them myself. Anything I can sort of say I did read as a kid that was similar was Bar Bar the Elephant, which I don't know if you've heard of that one, but they were all right. There we are. Let's sort that, that corner out there. But yeah, quite, quite sought after the moving books. Tiger in the Dark, 151. Wheel on the on the school. And the log of the ark. One five four. I could sort of feel it as I was going through. This is another one. But unlike some of the other ones, the cover hasn't come clean off. It's partly off. So I'm going to get the old scalpel in. And see if I can just tease, tease it off. Because it'll make re-gluing it much easier. seems one of the edges is managing to hold on but that gives us a nice clean edge to um to re-glue so we'll just whack it in there and leave the rest of it in situ because apart from that once again it's actually a pretty nice copy very very interesting that the glue going through these from this sort of period of books is uh, aged. I see this was a, a K-Web. I'll check the date on this just to see. Nineteen sixty-three. 
I can't remember off the top of my head exactly when K Webb took over editing Puffin, but I knew there was probably a transitional period as stuff that Eleanor Graham had started on finally got printed. Anyway, let's give clear the decks here and uh, give this lot a brush. So we'll do the first palm. Once again, I'll split it into three, I think. Okay then, let's get these few dirty ones in here, at least dirty top edges of course. And that's what we're addressing here right now and uh, the difference it's making is really great. Quite a bit coming off these. Lovely. Right, let's get 
the final part. Okay, so cracking on, 155, Carbonell, Barbara Slay. And the last little pile now, sadly, but they are really, really nice books. I, I do very, very much like these. 157, this was a recent pickup. So this one, I believe, has already been done. Yeah. Well, it actually has got, now that I look at it, has got a bit of a quite deep price there, so we'll get that off. That's better. Noel Stratfield, she wrote uh, Ballet Shoes, that was her big hit. It's probably the most valuable of the vintage Puffin storybooks, that's The Hobbit. I've had a, two or three copies of this through my hands, I've been quite lucky. But this was the best one I've uh, I've managed to keep hold of. You do occasionally see them in absolute tip-top mint condition. But mine's sort of, you know, a very nice VG, shall we say. VG plus, possibly. The Street Musician, 162. That was the first time The Hobbit ever got put into paperback. Really, really mint ones go for about a hundred nowadays, which is, you know, a lot of money for a paperback, uh, particularly a children's one, but it's Tolkien and uh, he's a collectible author. And compared to the first hardback of The Hobbit, it's pocket change. <laughs> Otterberry Incident, another one by, uh, illustrated by Ardizoni. A very, very distinctive style. Very, very nice indeed. I love these these books. They're beautiful. And he was such a great illustrator. Lovely. Happy Prince. Oscar Wilde. book that the movie was based on, 101 Dalmatians. Bit of a crease cover, but not too bad. Grey fires, Bobby. <laughs> That's a movie tie in it, shall fit this one. There's a stamp, but there's also a pencil name of some sort in there that we're going to get out. Robo. Right, this one's got a bit of spine to re repair. Yeah, it's not too bad. We've seen worse. enough to keep it down. Yeah, there we are. Looks 
bit better, didn't it? My uh, the screwdriver though has got very mucked up there, so I'm just going to clean it off. Okey doke. Right. Another bona fide classic, Swallows and Amazons. A great book there. Now, we are of the period now, so these books, these later ones here, were published in 1962. And unlike some of the early 50s ones, these ones have got slightly glossier covers. And this one, for example, has got a couple of little marks there, which I can't help but think might be okay if we were to give it a bit of a, a, bit of a polish, you know? I don't know how far we can go back comfortably to do it so it may be in actual fact we don't and I just do it on a couple of books which have got specific needs like this one so I think what I'm going to do because I've got those those two lines there I'm just going to pop some on this bit of cloth just to see if that makes a difference Well, it's cleaned around it, but it's still left those two sort of lines there, hasn't it? It hasn't exactly taken a lot off, so, you know, it is what it is, I suppose. Um, as I said, I wasn't intending to give these all a, a polish because most of them can't be polished, but that was a specific case. And in the end, it didn't actually make any real difference. Nineteen sixty-two. That one, a bit of a famous one. How to be top? Illustrated by Ronald Searle. Great, another great artist. Good stuff. It's got a name inside. which we will carefully dig out, like so. Thirteen clocks, James Thurber. It's a nice jacket, isn't it? <laughs> and the wonderful O. Also Ronald Serrell, Ronald Serrell jacket on that one. I guess this is the sign of K Webb now, joining Puffin. And slightly more interesting books are getting published. One we've missed in this run, because I haven't got a copy of it, is uh, A Bear Called Paddington. One I'm still on the lookout for. Hopefully going to pick one up eventually. It's... um what they call an early puffin, and it's in B format. And, uh, you know, I don't really want to be paying a fortune for it, you know. But I would like to get one. Cricket in Times Square. Okay, so let's give these brush down.
Lots and lots of dust coming off these. But that's okay. Lovely. Right, we've got one little pile left to do. It starts off with an absolute classic, The Little Prince. Beautiful book, scarce in the first Puffin storybook edition, as you'd imagine. 1962. Little 25p on the inside front cover. That's now gone. Gorgeous, gorgeous little book that one. Another one of my favourites, Charlotte's Web, we were talking about it earlier. This is the original puffin print, still in print today of course, this. Once again, I thought my copy was a little bit better than that. Nothing I can do on the spine there, it's, it is what it is. So I do hope you've enjoyed looking through these puffins as much as I have. There's certainly been some good books here. I haven't quite decided what I'm going to be doing next week or the next few weeks ahead. I haven't really looked at the schedule to see what's on the horizon. We haven't done a dedicated penguin or pan cleaning for a little while, so we're probably due one of those. So don't be surprised if next week we do the next batch of pans which i believe is great pans now this is one which is in b format so it's slightly bigger and it does say a young puffin the prints a bit larger as well as the book being bigger i think these are all quite scarce to find these days and that original paddington book i was telling you about that's in this format it's much bigger so it is what it is. Antelope Singer. spines just come away a touch
Thanks as always to my Patreon and channel members. Now you can join and support this channel by going to my other channel, just Jules Burt's Collections and Unboxings. You can uh, join the channel through YouTube. You can just head on over to uh, patreon.com, look up Jules Burt and you'll find my uh, page there if you want to join us on Patreon. Also, as I write this, I'm just launching um, a merchandise store. Big bit of fluff coming off there <laughs> with some stickers and things on. So look out for lots more in the future. I'm just starting to come up with a few designs, but I've got sort of my channel logo and things like that available on stickers and things and mugs if that's what you'd like to buy. And it does support the channel at the same time. This one's a little bit warm, but it's okay. It's okay. Bottom of the spine's already been repaired on that one. Well, even though they've not really needed polishing, because we can't, um, they have needed quite a bit of repair work, haven't they? So uh, it's definitely been good to go through these, and I'm glad we have. That's for certain, you know. It's been good to get them out. It's been ages since I have had these all out to have a look at. Oh, have a look at that in a sec. Looks like a little vintage bookmark of some sort. Blotting paper by the look of it. Yeah, just a bit of blotting paper. Mole Bridge Manor. Little Tempe in the corner here. <laughs> this is number 198. There we are. Number 200 is another large format one. Nice copy of that, actually. Yep, lovely. So let's give these a brush. Yeah, thank you for watching today. Sorry fans of uh, Mr. Sheen have not really seen it in action, but as I say, because of the nature of the books, can't really get away with giving these a polish because it will end up doing more damage than good. And none of them have been too bad, have they? Don't forget, there's quite a bit of a backlist now on the channel. So do check the older videos. I'll put a little link to the uh, the first part of this, the Puffins 1 to 100 in the description and on the end screen of this one. So you can have a look if you want to go back and see the first hundred puffins. Those are complete. That's the, they've got the whole lot of those. But there's lots of other great content for you to look at. Thank you very much for watching today, especially if you've watched it right here to the end. Do please hit that subscribe button if you've not already. 
still managing to get one of these out each week. And I should look forward to seeing you again next week with another video. Bye.